a retro ramble with. This episode's special guest has more Transformers than the National Grid. His knowledge of these transforming robots is amazing, and his collection even more so. He also collects other cartoon series toys and is into retro gaming. His main love is the Commodore 64, and you can often see great gameplays on his channel in relation to this. It gives me great pleasure to talk to Paul, the glorified toaster. So, thank you very much to glorified toaster, or my good friend Paul, as I know him. Hello, how's it going? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good, I, I'm good, I'm good. Friday night, I'm having a beer. Yeah, I know, I was tempted. What you have? What are you drinking? I'm drinking out of glass to look classy here, but really... Ugh. Fosters. Fosters, <laughs> oh, I love Fosters. Is it's that a... glass made out of a, a bottle? A gross bottle, yeah. That's excellent. My sister-in-law got me it for my Christmas one year. Brilliant Fair idea. I know. <laughs> so, I suppose... The first question that I ask most people is, how did it all begin, especially with the console side of things and all the computer side of things? Well, when I was, I must have been about eight, seven or eight, when we lived, we'd, moved, we'd just moved house from, from my first house that I lived in as a kid. And then we moved house, got this new house in a place in uh, Gala Shields called uh, Stanley Street. And the first ever console we got as kids was the Atari 2600, the, the, the Atari yeah. VC. And... <clears throat> I don't really remember asking for it or anything. I don't remember wanting one, but mum and dad got it. And it was just like, this is just the best thing since sliced bread. So good. I mean, we, we it, it was 50 quid at the time, wasn't it? It came out under 50 yeah. pounds, 50 pounds. Yeah. And we got, we got the, um, we got like Mario and Pac, Miss Pac-Man and Desert Falcon and all these games. I mean, now looking back, they're really primitive, but then it was like, this is just the best thing ever. Yeah, it's funny because I was saying this to somebody else I was into, Steve Benway, that um, because you could see something on the telly you could actually control, it blew your mind. It wasn't like it was being beamed into you, if you like. Yeah. What I loved as well is those old games, had you you got the box and you got the inlays, and because of the crap graphics... A lot of the story and the and the what you, what was meant to be on screen came for the inlays. So you'd sit and read the booklets and be like, "All oh, right, so that square is meant to be a, a centipede, and that square is meant to be a spider, and that's a skeleton." So you most of the enjoyment came from you visualizing what was on screen rather than just actually watching it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you had to use your imagination in them days. Yeah. Not like now. <laughs> there is no imagination in gaming nowadays. I, I was thinking about this because obviously I was I was pre-thinking what you might ask me and what we might talk about. And I was just thinking that modern gaming is so boring, yeah. and I just, I just, I just can't be asked for it at all. I, I don't, I very rarely play modern games, and I mean, I'll play indie titles and stuff, but no, like all your Call of Duties and stuff, I'm just not interested. <laughs> it, it's funny you say that because I think indie titles are making a big comeback for that reason because people get fed up of Call of Duty 21 or FIFA yeah. 21 or whatever because it's basically the same game with either different squad names or a slightly improved graphics <clears throat> whereas ridiculous. the indies uh, are more like you say back to what we remember i think as well with indie titles that they can be really creative and, and different you, you can play like that binding isaac that i play that, that was one of the first not not one of the first but it was the first big roguelike game that came out that sort of sparked all the other ones like um slay the spire and things like that pardon me and um it's just, it's fascinating because you can get really into it. And you, you, it's, it's almost like you don't know what to expect. It's like reading a book you've never read before. You don't know what to expect. Yeah. And it's a bit like, oh, can't wait to get to the next page. Whereas with modern games, you're just, like you can pick up a modern shooter, not, not so much Call of Duty, but one similar. And you, you pick up the pad and you know the controls without having to check. You're like, oh, well, that's, that's going to be duck. That's going to be fire. Yeah. And it's just, it's just awesome. I mean, I do play the Call of Duty games occasionally, but it's just when like they're free on PSN that month. Yeah. <laughs> and then I play them yeah. once and I delete them. Yeah. The, I, I find with those, obviously, you know, I don't play them because I'm not very good with 3D stuff, but yeah. you, you don't really know what's happening anyway because you're moving around that fast and just trying to shoot and pick people out, especially in multiplayer. You're not really taking notice what's going off, I don't think. <clears throat> it's like, I mean, Grand Theft Auto Five. I liked that game when it first came out, but the shine wore off really quickly because they create this massive, expansive city and world. But... I mean, unless you take your time to just like walk about the, some, you know that thing you do in Grand Theft Auto when you're bored and you yeah. think I'm just going to walk about and I'm going to look at the scenery and pretend that I'm going shopping and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's when you do that that, that you yeah. see all these amazing things and, and all the details and what what the, the effort they've put in it. But if you're playing the game to play it, 
that just passes you by and it could be anything. It's just, it doesn't really, I think graphics, they, they try and make graphics important, but they really aren't to me anyway. I, th- I think if you're playing Grand Theft Auto to pretend to go in shopping, I think you've been in lockdown too long. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I didn't, that's what, well, it's, it, mainly it's with Sophia because obviously she'll she'll have seen it and she, like she's not to play it obviously. But what yeah. I do, I think I think um, Andy Ice Cream uh, Ice Cream Van guys is yeah. the same. Let them play it, puts the sound down, and then they, they, oh, they, let's like I let her drive about and she can yeah. go to shops, but she's not to hit anybody and she can't hear the swearing, but. So that's what when we're just like, right, drive to the beach and we're going to go in the water. <laughs> well, I'll say hi to Sophia if she ever watches it. <laughs> this um, as long as I remember to not swear, she should be able to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't got a beeper, unfortunately. <laughs> so you started off with the Atari. What about the toy side of things and what got you into the toys like Transformers and He-Man, etc.? I had this conversation with my mum the other day, actually. She was saying that it's really weird that even her, growing up like around like men and then family and stuff, she says it's really weird how men specifically seem to really be into like enjoying the things they did as kids. Yeah. So she says it's and I made a sort of a, a misogynistic point that well, girls especially when she was younger used to play with dolls and houses and stuff, and now they've got kids in their own houses, so they can't they, they need to play with the, the fake ones. Whereas I'm never gonna have a real transformer or, or yeah. a real <laughs> undercat. But um, with me it was. Trans I had Transformers. I never had very many though because they were always. I mean, Woolworths had like a massive sort of amount of them, but they were always really expensive. If we were going to get pocket money toys, it was always like the cheaper, like the five pound and under ones, like He Man and stuff. Yeah. So I had a ton of He Man toys and stuff, but because I had a, a brother to play with, we used to have like we'd set up our figures and our cars and we'd have battles and we'd play games. So I think because I've got so many good memories of it. Or in toys, yeah. I think that's why my passion or my, my enjoyment of them has lasted through the the years. Especially when you get a bit older. You, I mean, you, I've done the the years of drinking and going out and waking up in random strangers' beds. I've done all that. <laughs> I've, I've I've pissed more money up the wall than I'd, yeah. I'd care to remember. Uh, yeah. I, I, I must have drank away. It's ridiculous. But now it's like, well, I've got a family. You know, I'm not going to go out that much. So just collect the things I enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, I think you get to a point in life where you do think that you ch- your priorities change in reality, don't well, they? Yeah, yeah well, when Sophia, I mean, yeah. it'll be the same with you. When Katie came along a bit, mm-hmm. things were just completely different. Yeah, yeah. And, and I always think, and she always threatens me with, well, you do know anything happens to you, I'm going to sell all your stuff. And I said, you just do. <laughs> you just do and I'm haunting you. <laughs> well, I've always said, the way I explain it to Caroline is the things we collect, like it's no like... Like unless something massive happens, like gaming stuff doesn't really depreciate that much, yeah. um, and I, de- I don't think it ever will. I mean, the prices fluctuate obviously, but I don't think there'll be a massive drop. The stuff that we have now is not going to be worthless, and it's the same with Transformers. They seem to keep their value, not all of them, but the majority keep at least their their resale value. If I bought it for a tenner, I can sell it for a tenner. Um, yeah. So the way I've I've always like sort of said to the wife is, once I get sick of these things, not that I ever will, I don't think, but. It'll be an investment that I can we can either sell it on or we can you know it can pay for something. Yeah. But if it gets to the point where Sophia enjoys them, she enjoys gaming. Not so much toys and trans. I mean, she's got her own toys and stuff. But if it got to the point where Sophia was really enjoying them, I think I'd just be like, "Here, it's yours now." <laughs> yeah, and there you go. You go and play with them. Uh, right. it, it's weird because you look at the kids' programs nowadays, and there's not that many toys associated with them, like there was like with cartoons with us. I think. It's because, I mean, programs, certain programs for kids will, like, I mean, I can only go off what Sophia watches, so Paw, Paw Patrol and Peppa Pig, that kind of crosses the ocean, you know, like you get it in America and you get it in all these other different countries, so they kind of have toys, yeah. um, but everything else, I mean, some of the CBB stuff she watches, you get, like, crappy, like, little plastic figures, but it's not all the kind we got, it wasn't, it's not, it's not articulated toys we, it's all yeah. just, like, rubbish little plastic, and it's not the kind of stuff you'd, that it would even last through time, never mind being able to collect it later on. So, uh, and, and cartoons these days, they're all really like generic almost. They're all this. There's, there's, we had cartoons that were like heroes versus clear heroes versus clear villains, and they were kind yeah. of grown up. Like Lionel was a grown up. Uh, the G.I. Joe, they all had bloody mustaches and stuff. Whereas <laughs> now the heroes are like SpongeBob SquarePants and things, and I kind of really see them. I don't think the cartoons would resonate with us with them the way they did with us. Like we were like, oh, like Lionel was, as a kid was a hero. Optimus Prime was a hero, and and even now when they when they remake it, 
he's a, he's a hero again. Whereas they don't really have that. In, ben Ten, I think, is maybe the closest they've got. Yeah, yeah. The Justice League. Is Ben Ten still going? I think that I don't care. It, it pops up on YouTube when Sophia's watching videos. I think they've read like you get loads of different versions where he looks different and stuff. Like films where he's grown up, but then there's other ones where it's like where it's it's like a sort of um, what's that cartoon called Teen Titans or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to the Titans. Superheroes. It's all jokey and stuff. So I think that's still going. But other than that, Sophia doesn't really. She's not got any. She watches things like um, like I said, Paw Patrol. She watches some Disney films, but none like she watches Frozen, obviously. But nothing. None of the cartoons have gripped her like they did when we were young. And you yeah. know, it's, and it's a week to week, like us as well. We we on demand. Like everyone, you can get a touch of a button. She's she's not looking forward to the next episode. I'm not. Saturday mornings were amazing for us. Like getting yeah. cartoons and like oh, sitting doing my breakfast. They don't have yeah. that. They just go on their tablet, one button, and they're watching whatever they want to watch. So yeah. nothing really, nothing really grips them. I think because it's it's like they can eat. It's like an, an all you can eat buffet. So they're not really enjoying one certain thing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's very similar with that with magazines. Well, back in the day when we get a magazine, we were looking forward to it to see what cover disc, what demo. Everything yeah. now is available at touch of a button. You download the demo. You can download yeah. the game, it, and I think it takes away from that anticipation sometimes. Oh yeah, I. You know I remember I mean? Friday night for me. You finished school, and it was like you had nightmare on on nightmare, ITV. Yeah. And then it was Fun House. Yeah. And the the real Ghostbusters was in there at some point, and then Fresh Prince of Bel Air was on after six o'clock, and that was that was like a, a, a sort of staple of my week. That was the start of my weekend. And it was like I'd look forward to it, and that, I wasn't in control of what was happening. I just enjoyed it. Whereas yeah. now, they did, it's, I, I, so, Sophia doesn't really look forward to anything because she can just she she, she absorbs it rather than than looks forward to it. It's really it's it's, it's hard to. I mean, you you can having Katie yeah. as well, like, yeah. but it's like it's like she never says, "I oh, can't wait for this to come out," or yeah. oh, "I can't wait, I can't wait for season three. It's all just like, "Oh, watch whatever's on Netflix." So yeah. it's. I, it's really weird and especially I, I tried for a while to get Saturday mornings to be like a thing for us where we'd sit down and we'd watch specific cartoons and we'd, we'd eat our cereal together she wasn't interested because she she couldn't be arsed waiting for the next thing to finish she was she yeah. was already thinking about what she's going to watch and stuff I was yeah. like I mean fuck you then <laughs> you, yeah. you, can, you, can, you can have your phone and go and watch what you want to watch and, and that's it you, there's no anticipation because like you say I can remember on a Saturday morning waiting for uh, Battle of the Planets or Godzilla or Starfleet yeah. on ITV. It yeah. was like that you're waiting for it, but now it's just there. So I suppose we're getting old. That's what it is. <laughs> but you know what, though? Even me, me, me and Caroline tend to watch like the shows we used to watch, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and stuff. Caroline likes all those vampire shows like um, Vampire Diaries and the originals, and I'm not really into them, but she can watch them one after the other. Whereas me, I kind of watch a couple of episodes of something, then I'll be like, right, you can watch what you want, and I'm going to go play computer or whatever. But that, what was it on Prime, The Boys? Oh, um, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Season, season one was amazing, so when they put season two out, and it, they put it out week to week every Friday, and the same with Picard, it was Friday to Friday. Yeah, 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 I was, yeah. I was raging that I couldn't have been yet. I was like, I've got to wait a whole week for another episode. <laughs> so I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a, I've been sucked in by that culture as well, and it's, yeah. It's just every every your fingertips have to wait for anything. Just anticipation. It's even Christmas is about the only thing that kids still have to wait for because you can't hear that at touch of a button. And yeah. they, they, Sophia goes nuts on the lead up to Christmas. She's so happy, and yeah. that's kind of what we had as kids looking forward to even the smallest things like pocket money on a Saturday or yeah. or Friday night Saturday night TV. And they just don't have that. So I yeah. think they absorb they absorb what they watch differently. Then it's not going to have as deep a connection for them as it did with us. Yeah. I totally agree. It's even down to small things like just going to McDonald's. That used to be a massive treat for us. Oh yeah. But now it's they're everywhere, so you get it all the time if you need it. To. Well, so Sophia will say like um, every night she's like, "Oh, can we get a chippy tea tonight?" And it's like a, chip, <laughs> a chippy tea for us was either a Friday or like a month, a monthly thing. It was never like yeah. a once, a couple of days. But she just she's just like she thinks everything is just you can get it. She's not she's not really grasped. She's when she's at that age where she doesn't really get money yet. But she still she thinks that you can just get whatever you want. Just like she'll ask her mum, Mum, can I get what was it the other day she wanted? Oh, she wants a green a green wig to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Didn't ask me why. Something to do with a Roblox game. And she, her mum's like, Where am I gonna get a green wig from? She's like, order it on uh, Amazon, it'll come tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my god, you're <laughs> bloody six. You shouldn't be thinking like that. Yeah, well that's it. Everything's available. Even like you say, you could order it up to ten o'clock at night and it'll be there in the morning. Oh, it's ridiculous. It's something eh? we never had. So uh... But so, 
after the Atari 2600, what, what was sort of your path in consoles and computers? Uh, after the 2600, we got a few Christmases later, the Commodore 64. Oh, the Commodore 64! Oh, <laughs> all phrase, the com- Anyway, I am... Um, uh, my, my uncle at the time had opened a, a computer shop with his, with his, his cousin. And... Um, so he, he kind of got my mum a, a Commodore 64 cheap with a few packs of games. And waking up on Christmas morning, we knew we were getting it because we'd asked for it. But um, waking up on Christmas morning and loading up the first game, it, again, like like the Atari uh, VC, blew my mind. The first game we played was, oh, it's, is it Infiltrator? It's one of the light gun games on the Light Fantastic pack. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And it just—it's a—it's a crap game. I think the first level is just a star field where, like, little rockets go past. You might shoot them, and it, and yeah. even even right up at the TV like that, you're <laughs> you're missing half of them. But um, the sound when it loaded up the Sid sounds and the Sid, it was like, it was like oh my god, this is amazing. And then the next game I played, I remember it vividly on Christmas morning was Batman: The Caped Crusader. All right, yeah. And the graphics on that for the time, and even now, still when you look back, oh, it's just it, it was mind blown. And after that, that's when. With the Atari VC, we, me and my brother would play it at night between having our tea and then going to bed, maybe. Um, but with the Commodore 64, we were like, right, can we finish our tea and go play it? And then, pardon me, yeah. can we play it on Saturday morning and stuff? It was like we wanted to play it all the time. Yeah. Playing. And the two-player games were like Bubble Bubble and stuff. We'd play that, and that's when that's when my love of gaming took hold. Like, I mean, re- retrospectively, I love the VC, and I can play the games now. But the Commodore 64 was the first time I was like, this is just amazing, and I want to just do this forever. <laughs> yeah, mate. Where did you get your games from? Was it like, did, did you have a local computer shop, or did you go to W. H. Smith or somewhere like that? Well, we had, like I said, my uncle had a a, a, a wee, it was a wee corner shop that was just, it was literally a counter and two walls with games. Right. Not even, it wasn't even as big as my bedroom here. And um, it's actually the shop that's next door to my mum and dad's house now. And uh, so we'd go in every, every weekend with <laughs> mum, and that was like, what? I was about again about eight nine ish. I reckon my memory's so bad, but um, we'd we'd go in at the weekend with, with pocket money. We got at that age we got three pound pocket money each, and we'd either buy a game each, which at two ninety nine, or we'd pull it and get like a five ninety nine game or whatever if there was a, or an expensive pack. Yeah. But we'd go in there, but then he um, went bust. <laughs> oh, right. So then, then, then it was John Menzies. The only place yeah. you could really get games in in uh, my hometown of Gala was John Menzies, and they had the big section up the back. You'd go past the magazines, past the books gaming section and they had just rows and rows of like Commodore, Specky, Amstrad. Oh, it was and I used to love we'd go in there every single Saturday. Like, like literally we lived like a sort of ten minute walk out of town and mum would get up in the morning, take the dog out, dad would be at work and we'd be like, Can we go to John Mendes? Can we go to John Mendes to spend our pocket money? And then it was like an hour in there just looking at game covers. Yeah. Knowing that you, you really can't tell much for the what was on those tape cassette boxes, you you can look at the, gra- the graphics, which were for every system. You could you knew what the title was, but you didn't care what kind of game it was going to be. You were like, pot luck. Yeah. Apart from, apart from Sam, Strop, Sam Fox strip poker, I knew yeah. what was getting there. <laughs> it's funny because you just sent shivers down my spine talking about it because exactly it must be everybody's memory who was at that era of going into some shop and having the racks of C sixty four Spectrum. Yeah. Amstrad, they were the big three, weren't they? Then you get like a few Acorn and BBC micros yeah. in the corner or whatever. So. What I used to love is when with the John Menzies here, I and mean, I'm sure it was the same in all of them. They'd have like the big, the big shelves, the whole big sort of aisle that was all Commodore games, and it would have like the one ninety nine ones on the top, then the two ninety nine ones in the middle, <laughs> and then the expensive ones on the bottom. So you'd yeah. always start off with the cheap ones because if you got a cheap game, you could then get like a sweetie as well if you had money yeah. left over. <laughs> or if there was an expensive one, you had to go. You had to, to go to my brother and be like, "I want to buy this. Can I have some of your pocket money?" And it was like a sort of bartering system. Like, right, oh, you take that and I'll keep that. And it's like, oh. and you, I, that, you, could, you could always tell as well with the more expensive ones, the case has got bigger. So you uh, had the small one that would then be a bit bigger for like the seven ninety nine nine ninety nine one. Uh, you, got, you got you got the single cassette and the jewel case that would just go slide up and down. <laughs> yeah, it busted. I hated them because they never fitted in with your like you'd have your games side by side and I never really bought the expensive ones that much. So you'd have like tape, 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 big cassette tape, tape, <laughs> yeah. tape. You're like, Fuck, I hate that. I used to hate it when we display my games. And and like you said as well, you used to look at the compilation ones. That that's something else that I really miss. Those, you know, like the ocean compilations or the Tato ones, where you'd have like yeah. ten arcade classics in one pack. Mm. Yeah, game. I mean, I games back then. It was like a, 
it was an event to buy a game. Even even though we normally got one once a week, it was an event, and you used to like you take a home and it was it was like an explore, exploration of what you were getting this time. And now, I mean, I refuse to spend fifty quid on, on a on a new computer game. Actually, I'll never do it. Um, luckily, the ones that I seem to want, like the Gears of War games, is about the last ones that I was really into. But they're always free on Xbox Game Pass, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but there's, I mean, now you, I think. It's like paying for games now is like paying for food. You, you know what you're going to consume, so it's, there's no there's no real buzz to it. There's no excitement like there was even even when it was like I think PS2, maybe even PS1 was when the shine wore off buying games for me. Yeah, I think PS1 at PS1 era you were still like getting bra- like there were still defining genres like platformers and racers. You were still getting brand new sort of games for it, but and then PS2 came along and instead of sort of like setting boundaries were just making the games better better graphics yeah. better sound and then that went on for there i think ps2 is where the where they sort of solidified what a third person shooter was what a, a sandbox game was that's where that's where they started to get their roots yeah. before that just anything goes yeah you, i mean i've got a stack of ps1 games and I'll, I'll be like i don't care what this is and i'll put it in and i'm like i don't care what to expect games like pandemonium or I think even even games like Spyro and that they're, they're I mean they're, they're they're coming back now as well as a genre, but at the time they were like it was a new thing. It was like the 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 the, the systems before the PS One never had games like Spyro, and like the systems before the SNES never had games like uh, Super Mario World. So every yeah. so sort of generation brought something completely new, and then at PS One that's when it stopped being new and just started being better. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. They just improved the graphics and right. the gameplay is still the same underneath it all. But it, it, I think you touched on it yourself when you said that um, you'd look at the covers. Now you go into an, a, a supermarket, pick up a PS4, pick up an Xbox One game. Can you imagine looking on the back of a PS4 game and it said, these are not the graphics, this is an <laughs> Xbox One or arcade version. Do you know what I mean? It just... <laughs> it, well, I, used to, I used to always look at the graphics and I suppose... Being a smug Commodore sixty four kid, <laughs> like it's only recently I've really started exploring uh, uh, NES. Uh, Z X Spectrum. I can't yeah. even say it. I'm, it's keep it in. <laughs> um, before that, like when I was a kid, I'd look at the graphics and be like, oh, "The Amstrad looks alright. The Commodore looks good, and the Spe he looks rubbish." So I was kind of smug about it because you, you want to get in the, the worst screenshot on the back. I know now that that's that, that's still what it's like. I mean, there's plenty of Commodore games that are way worse than the Specky versions, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, I, I, it was it was really was potluck, especially on the ones where the ones where they had the the screenshot like screenshot 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 for every system that was fine. But the ones where it was just like lovely screenshots, but then it turned out it was like the best version, like. Be yeah, it be the, it, the Amiga Amstrad. version. Uh, the Amiga, <laughs> Usually. You're, you're like, oh, bugger. And then you load it up and you'd be like, this is rubbish. <laughs> the amount I, of games I, you up and you were just sorry. like, they're terrible. That's I, I was exactly the same like that. I know it's. I've done a video recently on our driving for the C64. I oh, wanted boo. that for so long. And then I played it and I was absolutely gutted about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember... No, I think... I don't remember... Which one of my friends it was, but one of them, and this is at primary school still, had a a, a Spectrum, and they kept going on about hard driving. Oh, it's amazing! It's amazing. And then I got the what was the pack it was in? Uh, Wheels on, of Fire. I, I, and I got and I loaded it up on the Commodore, and I was like, this is just awful. Oh. What did they see? It? No, assuming that the Commodore sixty four version was, if not the same as better, better, yeah, terrible. And then I think what Monkey Spaz played it was the first time. She's not in the specy properly. And I was like, oh, yes, it's much better than the, <laughs> the Commodore 64 version. The Commodore 64 version is literally unplayable. It, it only ever came out on the Wheels of Fire compilation pack as well. It didn't get released separately, which just, I found interesting. A... You couldn't sell that game separately. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why they did it. What you come back and, this? Uh, taking it to John Menzies and punching the lady behind the counter. <laughs> I paid three quid for this. I want my money back. <laughs> I did that once, actually. Um, it was... I never punched a lady behind the counter. I mean, I'm going to say, <laughs> is this a confessional? Uh, f- finally coming out now. No, I don't um, know this man. <laughs> I, bought a dry- I bought a joystick, and it was like this white and blue thing, and it was for this. Uh, I think it was for the Mega Drive. It might have been for the Master System actually. Big, really, it's like it looked like one of the Cobra joysticks. And I thought, well, my, my Master System pad works on, on my Kobe. I'll just get that. And I got it for John Menzies not long before it closed, to be honest. And then I had to take it back in the next day. And it was like really expensive at the time. And the guy's like, "What's wrong with it?" 
And this is all I bought it, and it doesn't work on my Commodore. He's like, well, why would it? It's a Sega pack, a Sega joystick. <laughs> and he was really pissed off. Uh, now I know it's because the place was doing really badly, and it was going to get shut down, and he was going to lose his job. But that's the first time <laughs> I, I took a game back there, and I was like, I've been a customer for many years. This is disgraceful. <laughs> so, so you you was the one that pushed them over the head and probably closed them down. <laughs> <laughs> they had the meeting that morning. If anybody brings anything back, even ten quid, we're, we're screwed in that time with this pad. I'm like, take it back. <laughs> Oh, uh, so, <coughs> flicking back to the the Transformers, was it about the same time when you started buying those, or was that later on in life? I'd always had the like, so my gaming stuff I kind of kept all the way through my my youth and stuff. Like I've still got my original PS One and my original PS Two and things like that. Um, Have you no got your original been... Xbox. No, <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that 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 went. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, I don't like in jokes, so I'll just tell tell the camera. I uh, um, my ex girlfriend threw it off her balcony and it smashed it into a million bits. <laughs> and then she, then she bought one to replace it without telling me. But then when I went to play my Tiger Woods 2005 file, it wasn't there, and that's when she had to confess. <laughs> anyway, uh, I um, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll tell you when my, I remember the day my um Commodore my original Commodore 64 stopped working. I was um, 17. 17? Yeah, 17. And I had a girlfriend who lived up in Edinburgh. So I'd get every weekend, every second weekend, I'd get the train, the bus or the train up to see her, and she'd come down to me. So the Friday night, I'd been playing the Commodore 64. <clears throat> Turned it off. My brother said to me, I know you're going to wait until Sunday, but can I play the comment? And I was like, yeah, it's in my room, go play it. And then um, when I came back on the Monday morning, it was still on. And I was like, but did he turn it on this morning? And it turned it had and he'd left it on all weekend. <gasps> so when I when I turned it off, pop. Thanks, pop, yeah. And it just didn't go back on. <laughs> did you beat him then. for it? <laughs> oh no, it was a little terror. He was hellish. He used to break my stuff all the time. So it's just I was gutted, like I was really, really gutted because I at the time I had a real sort of connection to my comment. You know, I, I kinda sort of treasure them. Um my P my original PS2 is in storage now because I've got other ones and I didn't want to waste it by still playing <laughs> playing it. Yeah. So um, I I was I was gutted. I was really gutted, but it's just the way it goes. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So your Transformers and you bought them at the same time. Did you say, or was that later on? Or no, I I'd always wanted maybe not in my twenties, but when I was getting towards my thirties and stuff, and then in my thirties, I used to know friends that would collect sort of either Star Wars or Transformers, and it was always something I wanted to do. But again, I was still at the stage where it was work all week go out all weekend. It's Friday night came, I was out in the piss, Saturday out in the piss, Sunday in the pub, and that was my lifestyle. So I never really had possessions. I had my consoles and stuff that I'd had for growing up, but I never really had, I never collected anything. And then it was when I met my pal John, uh, Borders dude on, on YouTube, when he, I started working with him in Asda and he was doing YouTube videos about it and stuff. And Asda at the time had these little retro figures in, it was tiny, it's only about that size. It was an Optimus Prime figure and a Megatron and a, a Starscream. And they were like four quid or something, I can't remember. And I just bought them one day on a shift. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Transformers, like, a, like I had when I was a kid. <clears throat> and then he gave me a couple of really good ones one year for my birthday. And then I realised I had like a shelf full. Just, <laughs> just a, a dozen or something. And I was like, oh, these are really cool. And then um, by the time I had a girlfriend who was like, oh, you can only collect Transformers. That's what kids do. And she was a bit in arse about it. The same one that broke the Xbox. And uh, <clears throat> Um, so so I never really I bought, I bought a few other ones and stuff but I'd, I, me and John would, would I'd go to his house and would play with some stuff and he's like an avid gamer as well he's got his Dreamcast and his Saturn and he's he's got the, everything he's got all his consoles he's a, he's a massive Sega fan so we'd go there at the weekends and have a few drinks and I'd play with his stuff and I'd get really sort of into it and then when I met the wife uh, when, we, when I first met her I talked to her about these things and said oh, I'd love to do that and she'd be like well why don't you but my mindset at the time was still go out every weekend and get pissed. Yeah. So I never, and then she's like, oh, like I, I, I remember, remember when I got the Amiga 500, it was, um, we were in the British Legion on a Saturday night, getting drunk, as we did, and I was telling her about all these consoles and computers that I had as, as a youngin, and I wanted them back, and I was telling her about the Amiga, and I said, I love the Amiga, Amiga 500, I had as a kid, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she's on her phone, and then she's like, right, I've ordered one off eBay, and I'm like, what? <laughs> she's like, yeah, I've ordered one, it's coming next week, and blah, blah, blah. Turns out the guy that, She'd bought it, the guy that she'd bought it off on eBay was at the time the guy that was renting Craig is allotment. Oh, right, <laughs> Craig um, because, being one of our friends, obviously. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. 
I don't want to use second names and stuff in case. But um, yeah, 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 that's fine. I, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I said, oh, the way he ordered this, it came the day and I showed him the box and he recognised the name, I think, or something. And he was like, that's the guy that rents me my, my allotment. He's like a massive Amiga <laughs> fan and stuff, and it's dig in. And, uh, and she kind of, for, for them on, she just encouraged me to sort of like, she was like, I reckon if you collect this stuff. She, she kind of, I mean, she was a gamer herself to a certain degree. She's not into toys or Transformers. She kind of is now a wee bit. She knows, she knows a bit more about them through sort of yeah. osmosis and through sort of assimilation, but... She was the one that was like, if you want to get that, get it. If you want to do that, get it. Why no? And I was, she, she put me in the mindset to be like comfortable to collect, I suppose. And then I was like, yeah. And then then it just built and built and built and built. And then now I've got a room full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, take her straight from the miner's welfare to the wedding chapel to get married? <laughs> <laughs> How many Optimus Primes have you got now? So you collect those, don't you, I believe? Yeah. See, for a while, I was only putting... Because I had this this thing where I'm only going to buy Optimus Prime things if it's a transforming robot. If it's an Optimus Prime like lunchbox, I'm not going to buy it. If it's an Optimus Prime, I don't care, mask or whatever, I'm not going to buy it. But so, I've got a few bits now. I've, I've got like a fidget spinner and I've got the Optimus Prime Funko Pop. I've got like um the, the Pez dispensers and things. I don't really count them as Optimus Primes. But if you're talking just toys that transform, yeah. I, think, I think I'm at 70 now. 70, that's a lot, uh, <laughs> To be fair, though, I mean, there's there's hundreds and hundreds of the toys and what they call third party ones, which is these Chinese companies that make a a really extravagant Optimus Prime that's like it's like this big and it's like costs like four hundred quid. I've not got any of the ones. A lot of the ones I've got are fund in charity shops and stuff. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. There's very few. I think. Let's think. Maybe ten of those cost over twenty quid, and the rest were just twenty quid or under. I think yeah. my most expensive one was a hundred. And seventy nine quid, but I got it as a birthday present, and it was half price, so it was like eighty quid or something, yeah. nine quid. But I wouldn't if it wasn't for a. And that was my parents and my wife that pulled together to get that because there's no way I'd spend that much money on a transformer. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very much what I call a budget. <clears throat> I suppose, like you said, though it re- retains its price, so yeah. it's just like an asset in reality, isn't it? Well, the thing is, they, especially with the, the more high-end transformers, they only they only make certain amounts, so they they'll make a certain run, and then that's it. Unless, I mean, occasionally they will get re-released, but there's a finite amount. So I've got one downstairs called Shattered Glass Optimus Prime. It's a masterpiece figure, and it's like purple. It's like it's from a comic continuity that I didn't read the comics or anything like that. But it was like I said, it was really nice. So I wanted it, and that's like I mean, you can still buy them, but they're getting more and more expensive to buy like brand new. And uh, so I know at a certain point, once I'm fed up with that, the price skyrocket because they're just, they're just not going to be available anymore. Yeah. So I, a lot of them, and then there's other ones that like, pardon me, the beers make me fizz. Sorry. Uh, there's other ones that you buy in like Asda when you're out shopping, and they're, and they're like fifteen quid, and they're they're kind of half for the kids and half for the adult collectors, and they ones will, you'll only ever get like fifteen ten pounds for them if you resell them, unless it's a really sought after one. So. I'd say maybe 50% of my collection will never appreciate in value, whereas the rest of it really will. So I, I'd say I don't even want to think what I've spent on Transformers over the years. <laughs> I remember I remember checking. So I've been collecting since just before I met the wife. So you're talking like nine years now. And four years ago, I realised I'd spent just over £7,000 on toys <laughs> <laughs> in like five years. That's um, quite a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never told Carl because if Caroline's fine, I get maybe one or two a month. Not every month yeah. as well, but so I spend maybe now I'm spending like forty quid a month on them, which is it's not a lot. There's there's folk that spend three hundred, four hundred pound every month, which is ridiculous. Yeah. But um, that but even especially with with the, the kind of time we're living in and stuff, I'm not really keen on spending loads and loads of money. So I do kind of feel guilty even at forty quid toys and things like that, but. I, there was a point when I first started collecting where I was like, because now I'm quite choosy. I'm not really, uh, I'll go for what I want. But back when I first started collecting, I was just like, I'd go to the shop and I'd just start raking them into a trolley and be like, I don't care what it is, I've not got it. I want it, I want it. Uh, just walking down the, the shelf with your arm out, pushing them into the trolley. It's ridiculous. I well, and because I had less stuff back then, I could do that. You'd go to like, we got to Toys R Us when it was opened, um, rest in peace. Yeah. And I'd be like, I'll have that one for 20 quid and that one for 30 quid, <laughs> this one, and I'll get like this. And, and uh, at the time, me and Caroline were a bit better off than we are now. 
and uh, so I could do it. But now, if I if I was spending that much money a week on Transformers, I'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's like everything you spend when you can, and that's it, isn't it? Uh, and I'm sure that some of them as well, a bit like the retro stuff, there'll be the odd one that will increase in price because it becomes that's that one that everybody wants, if you like. Uh, I think the masterpiece figures. I think that's the ones that were they're aimed at high end collectors. They're like so. I've I've bought one that was like fifty quid, and I've bought one that was two hundred quid. Um, they will always get more more. They'll always be a sort of investment, definitely. Um, the one that I've got is Devastator, uh, the, the 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 big green one that turns into like trucks and constructicon vehicles. That I got that when my father in law was getting rid of all his assets. He was selling all his, his sort of assets so he could give his daughters their inheritance before he died. So you could right. witness them sort of spending it. And uh, I, I got this devastated. It was 159 quid. And at that point, I'd never spent any more than 40 quid on a on a toy. Yeah. And I was at my, when I, even ordering it, because that's a lot of money spending <laughs> on a fucking toy. Even ordering <laughs> even ordering it, I was like, oh my god, my, my, my bum was going tick, 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 tick. <laughs> and but it was it was a, it was his gift to me. I mean, we, I mean he gave yeah. us a, a, a substantial amount of money. So like 150 odd quid wasn't that much at the time. But still, it was like, oh my god! So, but that's a limited edition one. So when even now, you can only get second hand versions. There's no new ones, and that's only like three, four years later. And yeah. so that's worth quite a lot. But the problem is, I play with my stuff. I'm not like a, I, I'm not a on the shelf collector. So yeah. he's kind of getting, he's kind of getting on me and busted up and stuff. So <laughs> by, by the time I want to sell them, it probably might be worth anything because I've played them that much. Well, that that's it. Isn't it? There's two type of collectors. There's the collectors who collect just to collect and say they've got it, or there's those who enjoy them as well yeah. you know what i mean like buy them and use them that, well, that's what uh, i'm more like to be honest yeah uh, when i first again when i first met caroline and we we ended up living together i was buying like random ps2 games random mega drive games and I, and while i do play I, I always play what i get at least once i don't just get it and put it on a shelf <clears throat> but then i got to the point where i realized that all i wanted was the games i enjoyed yeah. Uh, I mean, there's certain games I will not pay for because they're too expensive. Games in the SNES and stuff. Um, Link to the Past is coming down in price. Last time I checked, you could get it for like 40 quid, I think. So, you know, that's kind of worth it. But at that point, I was like, if, if I'm going to play it, I'll buy it. If I'm not, I don't want it. I don't yeah. see the point in buying like a 200 quid game because it's popular or, or, or it's it's worth something it's sought after just for it to sit on the shelf. I, did, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it could be a picture of what, that game rather than the actual game, and it would make the same difference to you. So I guess I guess he, I'm not really a prestige collector. I don't. Yeah. My collection's for me. It's not for showing off or for anybody else. So I don't care if it's expensive. If, if I'm not, if it's even if it's worth nothing. If I enjoy it, then I want it. So. Yeah, that that's a bit like me with the the emulation side of things. I used to have all well, <laughs> you know, we've seen yeah. the videos, all the consoles, uh-huh. and it was just like you said, they'd sit on the shelf and they'd never get used, yeah. and. I think somebody might well have them who might get some fun out of it, if you like. Yeah. Uh, so, a, a downsize. Well, with me, I, I mean, I've got like, I've got plenty of consoles downstairs. I've got <clears throat> most of the Nintendos. I've not got the N64 because I sold it. Um, I've got all the Segas apart from the Dreamcast because I gave that to someone because um, there's broke. And I've, and I've got like all the Playstations and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but when it comes to playing like Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, Nintendo, I've got those systems, but it's easier to emulate now. And I, when I was buying the games, I was like, oh, you know, I'd, I'd rather play. I'd always rather play on the on the official hardware on the on the real system because it's just yeah. that smidge sort of more authentic. Yeah. But then I realised, just buy a sort of SNES USB pad, plug it in your laptop, and then plug your laptop into your TV. Same deal. <laughs> yeah. So and it's, it's the same experience. So I, I usually emulate. Um. But again, like I bought the the Commodore sixty four Mini when it came out. <clears throat> 69 quid it was I think, uh, got it in Smith's and I, 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 that was like what three four years ago now? if that yeah, yeah. there's not a week that goes by when I dare play it so I yeah, I, yeah, I, I know you had it all the time I, I buy things to play them I dare, I, I dare buy them to display them and I dare buy them to sit in boxes so yeah. <clears throat> I, like, I dare keep boxes for them because I know I'm not going to sell things like that on so I just chuck the boxes away and then the boxes <laughs> in the bin. play the shit at them and especially now we retro like I said I'm no not a massive uh, modern gamer, um, and it's a lot of yesterday with my patience and my time. But when, when it gets to the end of the night, I'm no sitting going right. I'm going to play like Grand Theft Auto for like the next three hours. I'm like, oh my god, I'm so tired. I'm so glad Sophia's in her bed and it's quiet. I, <laughs> I think I'm going to play like a, a game for half an hour, 
and I, I just want to pick up and play an old retro game rather than than yeah. like wait wait for the a game to load up and then watch a cinematic and then do a tutorial. I'm like, no, I just want to pick up Pac Man and play like ten minutes. I don't I don't yeah. want to I don't want I don't want it to be a, a marathon. I just want it to be a a, a wee snack a game and snack before I go about my business. Yeah. So for me, I, I'm not I'm not really I can't remember the last modern game that absorbed me. Um, maybe there's a couple on Game Pass that I quite like. Like I'm playing. Um, Remnant from the Ashes just now, which is a kind of Dark Souls clone. Yeah. Um, so that I'm kind of into that, but again, it's just like an hour here and there, and then, and then by the time I go back to it, I forget where I am in the game because I've never played it for that long. So it, it, it annoys me when you go back to a game and then it's got a massive update, so you don't end up playing it anyway <laughs> because it's got uh, like two hour update. <laughs> oh well, <clears throat> when I first got my um, PS4. I got it. We we were moving house that week, and we got it in the black. Fr- it was at Christmas. We got it in the black Friday sale, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And again, we, we, we it was a kind of luxury because it was in the sale. I managed to convince Caroline, my wife, and I was like, "Can I get?" She's like, "Okay, then whatever." But you're not playing it till we moved house. So we got to the new house, and I was uh, kind of settling down. I was like, "Right, PS4 time." So turned it on, set it up, and it was like, "This console must update to do all these things." Well, I never had internet because it hadn't been set up yet. So can you play the piston thing? So I was like, oh well, let's just this can go back in its box. I can't play it until we get, and it was like three weeks until we got internet or something like that because it was a new build, so they were still putting in uh, phone lines and stuff. Yeah. I was gutted. I could, I mean, the only games I had at the time were Call of Duty Three and one of the FIFA games. I think I it was it's a, a couple of games that I wasn't going to play, so I just gave it my brother because he had a PS4. You see, that to me is bad. <clears> that they're almost telling you you've got to be on the internet to play something which shouldn't be it should be able to load up even if it's an older version of the something you know what i mean so it allows you to play it so it's two things about modern consoles that piss me off and um, the loading times for like updates and all that kind of stuff is that's one of them obviously like you put a game and you're like right i'm gonna play a game it's the wife's way shopping the kids that are nans i'm gonna play put it in downloading four gig update what the f- that's not an update that's a whole game <laughs> Yeah. But um, and the other thing is uh, non non backwards compatibility. I've got many a PS One, PS Two, PS Three games like physical copies that I'd love to play, but I can't yeah, because the, none of the consoles. I mean, PS Two can play PS One, and the, and the original PS Threes could play PS Two and PS One. But if I want to play these games freely, I've got to have all the consoles set up rather than just like have the PS Four where I could put them all in. And yeah. we know th- we know through emulation and hacking. Or, or modern that these consoles can play these games, so it's a pain in the ass. The, 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 I find that the newer, well, Sony and Microsoft and the big companies, and even Nintendo to a degree, they know that you're going to have that retro urge, so they start putting them in the stores, don't they? Yeah. Like download this for seven ninety nine or whatever. So well, look at Nintendo. Maker, so. Look at Nintendo. They, they'll they'll put up the for each console they put the virtual console on it. And you're again, you're paying like six quid for Super Mario on the NES, and yeah. and none of them, none, like there's no code. Like, so if you if you buy Mario on the Switch, you you, you had it on the DS, you got to buy it for the Switch again, and then you have to buy it for the next console. And it's a game for like bloody, what, what, when did Mario the original Mario come out? I can't even remember. Eight. But uh, so so Nintendo really does live off live off their old properties and charge you through the nose for everything, and I hate that. Xbox One. That's the only reason. I mean, again, the wife got me the Xbox One just randomly. We did an argument one day, and um, she only told me recently about it. We'd had this massive argument one day. We're at, we're at the feather in laws. Massive fallout, and she stormed out. So when she comes back in like an hour later, I'm like ready to sort of like, can <laughs> fight or whatever. And she just dumps an Xbox One on my, on my lap, and she's like, there you go. And I'm like, did I win that argument? <laughs> as it turns out, I never asked her about it, but as it turns out, um, she'd already pre paid for it she was right. some somebody was one of your pals was getting a phone contract they were getting a free three free xbox one but they didn't want it and caroline said the call buy it off you then and uh it just so happened she was picking up that day that we fell out so <laughs> <laughs> and the fact you can now especially you can play some decent xbox original games physical copies on it and i mean i say that it recognizes a disc and then you've got to download the entire game which is again is a pain yeah. in the arse but and especially with the 360 titles there's loads of 360 games that i still play yeah. um now and then like the gears of war games and stuff <clears throat> so the fact you can play, play those on the Xbox One kind of keeps it in my favour. Yeah. The PS4, the PS4, you go into the, the the PS market, <laughs> the online market, the store, and they're wanting like twelve ninety nine for Grand Theft Auto Three on the PS2, and I'm sitting with like six copies of it behind me. I'm like, no, no, yeah. <laughs> that's not that, fair. 
that's a good idea with where you can if you prove you've got it it'll download it that's quite a clever idea to be honest yeah it, it always makes me laugh with the latest uh, the xbox series uh, is it series x and ps5 uh. ps5 is obviously not backward compatible at all but the xbox series x i think there's a dev mode that allows you to install retro retro arch and yeah. you can actually play the PlayStation 3 and 2 games on that. <laughs> <Can you? laughs> yeah. And I know the Xbox the, the Xbox one that I've got, you can put that in dev mode and it can play emulators. But the only reason I wanted to do it was because I thought I was trying to work, because before I got this laptop, which is still a pile of crap, but I had no way of even attempting to stream. And I was thinking, well, if I can get emulators onto the Xbox one, then I can stream for there. But as it turns out, when you put it in dev mode, you can't stream. So yeah. I get it. And I, I was like, ah, bugger i was like oh well that was a, it was a good it was a good idea although it is i mean it is the kind of thing where if i had to get rid of everything and i was going to keep the xbox i would do it just to have the emulators obviously it'd be, it'd be a really good way to emulate actually i think with emulators it's going to keep the retro game scene alive because it's going to come a point in time where the hardware will no longer work because either it's broke or it'll need updating so there probably will be the um, die hard people who've updated the capacitors and things on them but <laughs> yeah. the majority will just end up being thrown away i think yeah i think uh, there will be a point where like every every console pre a certain point is just a display piece yeah and that's it there's nothing there's nothing you can do about it but then again like if there is, is these components and these these the technology becomes cheaper they, they'll just release like if, if for example the atari links say for some reason they were all gone and they couldn't get any more working ones they, they'll just make a new one and it looks like the old one and say here you go this is and they'll sell it because yeah every, every everything that is wanted will earn money so they'll just make it atari links mini sounds like an idea <laughs> uh, it, it would be hard to make it a mini either the thing was fucking huge it's like this size <laughs> it Portable was huge. my ass <laughs> so did you have an amiga or an atari st or anything like that yeah. when it back in the day yeah i had so this this is kind of how my gaming history went the, the vc the commodore 64 the atari st ste i think and then the super nintendo and then after that i was kind of an age where i could buy stuff yeah. so then it was like everything that came out i got so weird by the time i was in my 20s i'd had nearly every single like widely available in the uk console like i never had an amstrad and i never had a i never had a nez when i was younger um they did this it'd be a thing i mean i, no, had, I don't think they were no i had one pal who had a, a, a he got a nintendo for his christmas one year and he had two games and um, little nemo and super mario brothers and that was it that's the only games he ever had and a dick in if he even got any mirror but that was the only time i was ever experienced that and it, i mean mario the first mario back then was like absolutely mind-blowing felt so cool to play and so smooth and responsive but no, so I never had a, but I had a Master System, had a Mega Drive, a Saturn, a Dreamcast, every new console that came out because I was such an avid gamer, I'd buy. Um, a lot, I mean, some of them were sick. I mean, I, my Lynx was second hand. Um, my Amiga was second hand. I got an Amiga after, like, I had the Atari ST and I thought it was the bee's knees. And then I went to the, our, my, my friend and yours, Craig and Andy, I'd go to their house and they'd have the Amiga. And then I was like, oh, my Atari ST's crap. <laughs> And then I was you like, "So you should have stuck with Commodore. You, 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 you betrayed <laughs> the truth." Well, the thing was, the uncle that sold us the Commodore, he was he's he's like an IT manager for a big company. Or he was, he's just retired this year. And uh, so he was always the one advising us about computers and what's the best and stuff. So he sold the Atari the Atari ST to my parents. He was like, "You've got to buy it. It's great. It's great for this. It's great for that. You could use it for office work." Blah, blah, blah. So they bought it, and I was I was happy with it until again I played the Amiga, and then I was. Seeing like games like Speedball Two and and Another World, which I know you can get on the, the Atari ST, but just the sound and and just the whole the way I mean the the, the Amiga just looks amazing. I was like, ah, oh, I want one of these, and I, I ended up swapping a uh, Super Nintendo for an Amiga Six Hundred, I think it was, and that was my first Amiga. But it had a hard drive and stuff, so it was dead, it was dead well kitted up. Oh, I loved it. That Amiga is my favourite computer. As I said on nearly every interview we have done, <laughs> it was the one I remember the most. So, but it's uh, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say there are certain consoles, uh, consoles and computers, the three D O, the Atari Lynx, the Amiga that kind of almost seemed ahead of their time. Yeah, and we're always, always sort of head and shoulders above their their sort of competitors and stuff. So at the time, the Amiga, I mean, the the Atari ST, I loved, played it to death. We had a, one of my brother's pals, even though he was like eleven. One of my brother's pals, his dad just used to give us just, he'd go around to his house and be like, what games do you want, boys? And as long as you took the discs, 
he was just getting game <laughs> after game. So just, just, I think we only bought about three yeah. like actual games for the Atari ST, and the rest were just stacks and stacks of copies. <laughs> but I when I got when I when I started playing the Amiga at, the, at my friend's house, I was like, yes, I have to get one of these. This is absolutely fantastic. Just the sound, the 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 the, the audio for the Commodore sixty four and things in the Amiga, it's just so much higher that it just makes the experience way better. Yeah. Well, weren't, weren't the uh, Atari ST the same sound as the Spectrum, as I've told on numerous occasions? I was going to say, I've, I've heard that somewhere, but I kind of think, where? Um, aye. Is that actually well, true? I've never actually thought to it. Yeah, it is actually true as well, yeah. I don't know if the ST was a, um, an improved version or not, but it is the same sound chip, so. Yeah, aye. Yeah. It does sound uh, like a one to eight to be honest, when it plays, so. Well, again, I didn't really at the time. I didn't really think about it. I just thought the Amiga, the Amiga was better. I knew like then, but like when I watch like your streams or or anybody like when we when we go down to like have a retro weekends and stuff, that's when I'm noticing the big quality difference. And like that's when I'm I'm seeing that there's no so much shine on the, the on the Atari ST. <laughs> and it's a, it's a shame. Like I, I mean, I, again, I had loads of fun. The eventually the Atari ST was put up in my parents' loft, like in like set up. This tiny wee color TV, and all me and my brother used it for was Sensei soccer tournaments. Yeah, we just sit up and loft and play Sensei, and that's all it was used for. Soccer. Uh, Classic game. It, it's funny though. The irony is the the Atari ST with the MIDI port could produce better music than the Amiga, but it just didn't use that in the games because it was a different chip. So, so YouTube. How did you get into YouTube? What what started you on that path? Well. Two people, Monkey Spaz five thousand and Borders dude. Uh, Monkey Spaz James obviously does the 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 gaming side of things, and he does. He started off doing videos on what it was. It was mainly collection videos with him. Like I picked up this for the spec, yeah, blah blah blah. And then as he got made and made into it, he was doing reviews on games and, he, and eventually playing games. And it was something I really wanted to do. So I remember, again, when I first met Caroline, I, I got a Super Nintendo. So I did, I did a video of me cleaning it. I was like, oh, I'm going to clean it. This is what I got for eBay, and I'm going to clean it, and I'll kind of see if it works and stuff. And I, I did a couple of videos like that. Um, but I got to the point where I was thinking, who wants to see a, a, a Scottish guy showing you, like, five PS keep two games that you got in a charity shop? It's, I just wasn't enjoying it. It wasn't fun. I wasn't getting anything out of it. And then I knew nobody else was, because it was, like, getting 16 views or whatever. And then, But then when I started hanging out with John who did the Transformer videos Transformer reviews that's when I really sort of started like thinking about making proper reviews with titles and, and what was what I was going to say and, and you know and trying to make it funny and, and that's when it picked up for me and then I just I've really enjoyed it to the point where I was like I was just I'm, whenever I've made a YouTube video I've always done it just for the fun it's never for like I didn't check my analytics and I didn't look at my normally I didn't look at my views and stuff but um, it was just it, was, it became a hobby and like, I used to love doing it I mean at the time, Caroline would be my camera person. She'd hold my phone, but it's, so she could check if I was in frame and stuff. But now she can't do it because of her pains and stuff. So she can't hold her, her arms up for that long. But <clears throat> at the time, it was like a sort of joint thing. We'd do that and then we'd watch it back and have a laugh. And then yeah. that was it. We never, I never thought about my videos after that. So, and I then, but then I obviously I started going go to conventions and start to speak to people. And you'd get to meet people through doing YouTube. Yeah, and I, and, then, and especially when you get comments off folk and, and folk actually enjoy your videos, I kind of got a buzz off of that. So yeah, and it's just never left me I, because I do it for myself and not for the views. Because I know plenty of people who do YouTube, but they do it. They, they kind of they, they come at it from a sort of what they want to make it a professional thing or a, or a sort of a way to earn money for them. And you can tell they do it for the money. They're doing it for the for the, with the end goal of it being something bigger than just fun. Yeah, and you can yeah. tell the, the and then ironically the fun gets sucked out of it for them and you can yeah. see their play, they're playing to what they think the audiences want it just you can tell when someone does it with suit and join it and and I, I'm never like that I just I mean I don't care I, I'm quite I've got quite a lot of issues like social anxieties and I get, you know I'm not again I'm not really good in crowds <clears throat> I can speak to a camera like this and speak to you like this dead easily yeah, yeah. but if if we were in the same room no obviously not you but like if, if it was someone else I bet through Transformers or like that. In the same room, I'd be a bit like nervous and couldn't do it. But when I'm speaking to a camera, yeah, it's steady. It's dead easy, and I can be myself, and it kind of it's kind of freeing. And that's because what... you're in your environment, isn't it? You're in your own yeah. environment, and you can speak. <clears throat> I'm quite lucky where I don't really care what people think of me. Yeah. So, like, I know best way to be. 
God, I, and, I, and I've tried to tell folk that my, my brother for years was hung up on on his image and like what folk thought of him and stuff. Folk that he, he didn't even can, and, and he used to he used to dress a certain way and act a certain way, and he wouldn't do certain things because he'd think, well, what if somebody thinks that on me, or what if somebody says that? And I, my, my friend John, I've I've heard him get some because he is quite a quiet lad, a really really nice guy, really genuine guy, a good friend, but he's quite quiet and he's, he's an easy target for folk taking the piss at him sometimes. He wouldn't he wouldn't stand for it certainly. But it, it, like folk weren't feared to comment on him doing transformer videos and things like that. And when I first started doing videos, I thought I'd be the same. I'd be a bit timid and like, oh, I'm, I'm feared that somebody leaves me a negative comment or I'm feared to get laughed at in at work or whatever. Folk find out. But then it turned out I didn't care at all, and I, and I'm free to enjoy it. And that's why it's kind of like, like I said, it's freeing. And I just I just love it. It makes me happy. Well, <laughs> you frequent the arcades. Did you have any arcades around you? We had. We have a thing around, so I live in the Scottish Borders, and we have this thing up here, it's, they call it the, the, the Common Ridings, where every town celebrates its its origins or its birth, its, its creation. Yeah. We have, they have, a, they have a week dedicated to the, the town and it's all celebrations and stuff. So uh, in my town, Gal Shields, uh, they'd have it, it would start on the Monday with all the horsey type stuff and all the ceremonial stuff, but then on the Wednesday, you had the shows, they t- the, like the, the amusement rides, they'd turn up and they'd all set up in this big park. And it was like huge. So every year that was the start of that whole week. It was like, right, we're going to the shows with your gran on the on the Wednesday night. And, and all we really did was my, my gran and papa would take us. They'd go do the bingo. They had a big bingo stall outside with the collar going to all the hots, 24. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so they'd, they'd go sit there and they'd just give us a handful of change and be like, right, off you go. And we'd, we'd wander across to the arcades. Didn't really play Hook the Duck or go to any of the rides. We just went to the arcades and they had, I mean, my love of the Turtles arcade comes from there because they had the turtle, the four, the four sticks. Yeah. Turtles Arcade, and that's everyone was just around that. And it's Kawabunga, Kawabunga. You'd have a <laughs> line of kids waiting to take over for whoever, whoever run out of money. Um, I remember playing the first Mortal Kombat arcade there as well. Um, obviously, I was a bit older at this point, maybe like 14, something like that. And I went in, and there's one of the guys that was in my year at school was playing it. And so I joined it on player two, <clears throat> and I just started doing Street Fighter 2 moves. Like, like half yeah. circles and stuff and started doing all the moves and the guy the guy next to me was like oh, how did you know how to do that you're amazing and like I started impressing all the kids <laughs> I was like, I'm just, just doing the same move as Shooter. Yeah. so that would come every every year every June the end of June that would come and you'd have four days or three days where they were there so we'd go do the arcades other than that um, we had a, a video shop a video store and it was a sort of mom and pops, as they call it in America, where it was a sort of privately owned like business. Yeah. And uh, he had he had all the arc- the videos, uh, the arcades. He had all the videos in the front of his shop, but at the back he had like a dozen arcade machines. And right. that's where we'd, we'd go there at school lunch, and we'd go down and play Street Fighter Two. And um, at one point, he had this is it the arcade cabinet, um, Street Fighter Two Rainbow Edition, where right, um, the, the hacked version. Ah, uh, where you could do yeah. the moves in the air, or you could. Yeah. <clears throat> we used to like that's one where you, if you press the player start button, it changes the character while you're playing. <laughs> so if so you, if you selected Ryu but you weren't happy with him, you could you could press this button and your your character would just change through the, through the roster. But you, you couldn't go as Balrog because when you did a, a forward punch like his special move, it fired at two fireballs, so it was impossible to beat. <laughs> so you'd see you'd see two kids battling out with some characters, and then all of a sudden the one getting beat would just batter his button, change to Balrog, and be like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I got most of my arcade experience from because we'd go there and play all the time. They had things like they had Chishis Q2, they had Willow, um, they had the Terminator 2 shooting gun game at one point. Uh, what else did they have? Narc, they had the Narc machine, I loved that. Um, they, had, they had a platform game that was kind of like Willow, and I've, I've looked through arcade games and platforms, I, I can't remember what it's called, I just remember it was fun. Um, I played that all the time, and I think. What else did they have? They had Nork. I think they might have had Space Gun at one point as well. Or something similar. But aye, that's so we used to go there and play it. And me and my brother just lived in the corner. So we'd <clears throat> we'd say to Mum or Dad, can we get like 50p? Because these arcades were quite cheap. We'd, we'd go and play like whatever for like 10p a show. I was digging. 10p, yeah, I remember putting 10p. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye. We went on holiday down in England, so Margate, I think. Years and years and years ago. My grand and papa were still alive. We went down on a family holiday and my papa took everyone to the, sort of the working man's club and they had two arcade machines, Packland and Double Dragon. And they were 10p <laughs> a pop. We just played them solid all week because that was that's all we could do. We were too young to do anything else. <laughs> Double Dragon. It's a shame because I know there's still arcades at the seaside today, but they're all fruit machines or ticket games. There's, yeah, there's not any not, arcade, arcade stuff. And even now the Gala Shields ones, because they, they still come around every year. I've not been in a few years, obviously, because I've, I've moved... 
like up in the country and things and, and plus I've just never I'm too old to go really but um, <clears throat> the last few times I went a lot of the arcades are the same ones that I had as a kid but they're just wrecked yeah. the tur- last time I was there the Turtles arcade was still there but oh, none yeah. of the none of the joysticks were in it. The, 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 <laughs> it, was just, it, was just, it was just, and the screen had a big crack down it. it just, when you see that, you're gutted because you're like, oh my god, that used to be amazing. Now it's just derelict. It's horrible. Derelict. <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't really have arcades now. You like you say, it's all the two P droppers and stuff. This the yeah, Peter two P in. It's it like a lot. <laughs> it's interesting that some of the ticket machines are starting to go back with the older games, like the Space Invaders and the. The Pac-Man ones, yeah, um, which is quite interesting. But, um, so my question was going to be: I, I was looking through your videos and your first video. Can you remember what that was? I know what the first video on my channel is. I think is it the one with the thunder and lightning? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I watched it today and I was laughing. But to two questions: one, what were you doing on Aldi roof? And two. <laughs> When you when you swore and like dived under, under cover, <laughs> right. So what happened was me. I, I was living with my, my brother at the time. My brother had a flat, and he was he had a flatmate, and the guy moved out. And I I think I was staying at my mum and dad's at the time. I just split up with a girlfriend, and I was staying. And he's like, "Come live with me." And I was like, "Cool." He lived in a massive block of flats. He was on the top floor, so he had the sort of the, sky, the sky, skylight windows. Yeah. Anyway, this one night we're sitting playing the Xbox, and it's absolutely torrential rain and thunder and lightning, but it just stops. So I opened the window, I pulled it open to look out and I was videoing it. So And it was right next to Aldi, so I'm looking down and <clears throat> I'd got a couple of big flashes on the camera. So I thought I'm going to try and record a really good one. <laughs> so I'm recording and it's quiet, the rain stopped. You can't hear anything. And as you see on the video, all of a sudden, and it felt like it was right above my head, a massive explosion. <laughs> I actually fe- I actually fell back into the house because like, I was leaning out the window. I fell back and I went, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> it, was, right, it was way louder than I thought it was. It, it, way louder than it comes off on camera. I absolutely shattered. Uh, that was my first video. Eh? I think that it should be viral because it's so oh, funny. It's I because uh, I wasn't expecting it either because the thunder had been quite loud, but it hadn't been that loud, and it literally <laughs> it must have it must have burst just above the building, like you know, uh, directly above the building because it was like so loud. I actually thought I'd been shot. I was like, I fell back at the building, I was like fuck it, and shut the window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's definitely... Excellent video. And what is? Um, you obviously, your name's Glorified Toaster. Where did that come from? Is that does that mean something, or is it just? Well, when I started doing YouTube properly, like when I was putting effort in it, <clears throat> and I was doing like retro gaming pickups and stuff, I went by the moniker Retro Paul because it's like Ret- Paul Collector. And that's all. I just I didn't even think about it much to be honest. And the, but then when I started collecting Transformers and doing videos on that, I thought, well, I have to make the name more about that. So it was Retro Prime. And I like that name. Like, even when I do my videos now, I'll go, hi guys, it's Retro Prime. No, it's no. And then I have to sort of think. Yeah. <clears throat> but then I got to the point where my channel was, because I'll do like specy games and Commodore games and just talk at the camera, it wasn't really, I've never really got a theme. I just like doing videos. And I also, I realised that whenever you've got, an, an, I've said this to you before, so you know, but whenever you've got an unimaginative title for your YouTube channel, if it's gaming, there's always retro in there somewhere. And if it's yeah. Transformers, it's always something prime and prime this and that. And I got a bit like, I felt like I'd picked like the most generic name possible. Like, <clears throat> I like when someone's got a name that you can just... Anyway, so I was thinking about what what can I use on my... What's really unique to me that makes me laugh or that reminds me of something specific to me? And um, I remembered I had the username glorified toaster on my yahoo chat years and years and years ago and that comes from an episode of voyager right. where um jane i think janeway's fixing our um re- replicator in a room she, she's on the floor fixing a replicator and chakoti walks in and she says i call this thing a glorified toaster once and it's never forgiven me <clears throat> and that's where that comes from <laughs> so that's, that, that i like names like that that actually have got a history behind them Mine's yeah. quite boring, retro rewind, but it it was done many many years ago. You know, like yeah. when you try and choose something and it all been taken, so it would yeah. give you something like retro four three seven two six <laughs> nine eight. I thought yeah. no, that's no good. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to change it because I thought, well, people who watch it know that that's me. But then I really didn't get enough viewers for it to be an issue, so I thought, fuck it, I'll just change it. And I don't think anyone's really minded. I've not had any comments on it anyway. So I like the intro. Oh. I like the um, the intro that you've done as well, the recent one. So yeah, I downloaded. I um, was it Kane Kane Master or something? 
it was an app on my phone for doing it because it's got mere effects in the one I use. And uh, I spent ages making it and trying to get it right and choosing the music. But then when I went to render it, it says, to render this video in HD, you must pay... <laughs> and I was like, nah, fuck that. So what yeah. I did was I just, I just played the video on my phone while I was recording this, like, on the phone, rec- done a screen record. And, so, yeah. and then that's how, that's how I did it. So. <laughs> yeah, there's too, always too, ways around things. Oh, God, I. Well, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to take part on the, the Retro Ramble. It's been really good. I really enjoy Definitely. it. I've been looking forward um, to it. I'm, I'm happy we've managed to get it to finally work. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and I'll put a link into your channel below. Obviously, it's down there somewhere. Sure. <laughs> and um, stay safe. And I'm sure we'll meet up at some point when we have the retro weekend, when all this And I wait stuff. for the next retro weekend. I know. It's going to be really good. There'll definitely be a few drinks flowing. Oh, yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, Paul. And Thanks I'll for having me. again soon. Bye. Bye. Wait, wait, can I say oosh? Uh, oosh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to ask about you, oosh. <laughs> Next time on a retro ramble. Yeah, it was the right decision, wasn't it? Which you don't often say about Commodore. But it was the right decision to want to go down that path. And they weren't the first. You had the PC Engine back in 88 with the CD-ROM add-on. Um, and there was the, uh, what was the other computer? The, um, uh, was it NEC brought out a computer? Again, gone from my head. But there were there were a couple of other computers that came with the CD-ROM as standard, and we were starting to see it on the PC and the Apple Macintosh. Um, but the problem was they tried to recycle the Amiga 500 hardware, and again, mm-hmm. this is where they should have stepped it up with something of a Chop 68000's capabilities. You know, the Amiga 1200 or the AAA um, architecture should have been ready at that point. I would just like to say a big thank you to all the special guests who took the time out of their busy schedules to appear on Retro Ramble. It is really much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of the Retro Ramble with. All links to the special guest channel can be found in the description below this video. If you enjoyed watching then please like and subscribe and click the bell notification icon to be informed of when the next episode is uploaded.